Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Oh, wait. Okay. Do we have that? We have a hum. Hang on. No. Just, I'm, I, I am, I'm here, and um, welcome to those of you who are in the parking lot. Welcome, we're happy you're here. Um, also, welcome to those of you who are joining us on Facebook. Um, and I know it's not Holy Humor Sunday anymore, but we can still be happy. And this is just a reminder. We can still smile. We can still have a good time. We can still laugh in church. So just, just remember that. I had my little pom-pom because, gosh, I spent quite a little bit on, these, on this number. And so I want to get as much use out of it as possible. <laughs> and um, thanks to those of you who joined us last week at Holy Humor Sunday. We're grateful for that. And um, a reminder to those of you on the Music and Worship Committee, we have a meeting this week, uh, 7 o'clock, Tuesday evening. And um, welcome, <laughs> welcome to people who have... Beth Gebhardt is here today. We, she hasn't been with us except for online for a while. So welcome, Beth. We're glad to have you. Also, um, just a great big thank, word of thanksgiving um, for the efforts of Ken Ruth. Ken, uh, when the fighting started in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, um, Ken decided to do something about it, and so he started. He lives on a golf course, so he started collecting golf balls that were lost and. Um, and selling them, and so today, now this is, uh, today he has given me $382 from all that have been, have been collected. So, um, I think there's still some more things you can get back there. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some, there's some golf balls left, so you can, you still have a chance. But as of right now, uh, what he think, he, what he believes is, Together with the other donations that have been um, made, we've raised $1,187 for Ukraine relief. And so give yourselves a big round of applause. <laughs> Thanks for supporting uh, this effort, and we will be taking care of this immediately um, to get that off. And so thank you so much to everybody who contributed. Also, um, just a reminder that it is still the Easter season. Um, also, oh, also I just someone brought to my oh, Linda brought to my attention that it still says in C News that we have um, confirmation today. We do not. No confirmation. We finished up last week and. Um, the next thing confirmation has to worry about is their uh, day of confirmation on Pentecost. And so, um, lucky them, and they were great. I was so happy to have the four kids that we had, so grateful to their parents for, and grandparents for getting them here each and every time. And uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to have gotten to know those kids a little bit better. And now, my friends, I invite you to join with me as we worship God Almighty. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. <clears throat> oh, wait. I don't want to get this wet. Here, David, you take charge of that. All right. Dawn nicely cut me an evergreen branch, so... This won't go to the balcony, though, sadly. <laughs> okay. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ. And we are a new creation. For this saving ministry and for this water, let us bless God, who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life, 
flowing freely from your throne. Through the earth, the city, through every living thing, you rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters, you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and the troubled waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forevermore. Amen. From the shores of our lives, Jesus calls us into the celebration of worship. Let us worship our God. From the edge of our worries and concerns, Jesus calls us into hope. Let us claim the hope in Jesus. From the shallow places in our hearts, Jesus calls us into the depths of his love. Let us celebrate the gift of his love. From the breaking waves of sadness in our lives, Jesus calls us into joy. Let us renew our spirits in his joy. From the rising tides of our conflicts, Jesus calls us under the shores of peace. Let us rest in his peace. Let us celebrate the love of God and receive the blessings of Christ Jesus. Let us worship God. The disciples make a big splash and eat breakfast with the risen Jesus, waiting in the water, remembering baptism, and eating with Jesus, celebrating Holy Communion, is our weekly encounter with the risen Christ. Jesus asks us again and again, do you love me? And Jesus invites us again and again to follow him, bringing the Easter life to others. Let us pray. Creator God, 
We may be the change that opens our community to the impossible, that accepts people can change and be renewed, and that your patience in time is long enough for us to find the right time to come to believe love is stronger than hate, goodness is stronger than evil, life is stronger than death. We can hold on to our hurts until our hands begin to cramp and keep holding. Though they bow our backs, we refuse to set our grudges down because we don't know what it would feel like to have that weight off of us. And we think that this is the way God operates as well. But God's anger lasts for a moment. While the grace, the forgiveness, and the hope that God offers us never goes away, let us dare to bring our prayers to the one who hears us and heals us as we pray together, saying, Now that now Easter, Easter is done and gone, Holy One, we, we no longer hear the special music, but, but listen to temptation's familiar refrains. We no longer walk those straight paths of joy and wonder but wander the crooked streets to our old haunts. Rather than living in the newness we bring, we do things the way they have always been done. Fortunately, God of seaside breakfast, you know the way we are in our messy lives, and so take us by the hand to lead us. You wipe our busy schedules off our calendars, so we may spend more time with those who need our love and attention. You challenge us to the fish from the other side of our worlds, so we may pull in all the grace, wonder, and mercy offered to us by Jesus Christ, our brother and savior. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Why should we weep? Joy comes this morning, and every moment of our lives, God has come to share mercy and hope with us so we can praise our God with joyous hearts. We will lift glad songs of joy for all the blessings God has given to us. We will offer our hearts and hands in love and serve to others. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen.
seated. The first lesson is from Acts, the ninth chapter, beginning at the first verse. Saul, later called Paul, was an ardent persecutor of all who followed the way of Christ. This reading recounts the story of his transformation, beginning with an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and through his eyes were open. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananus, Ananus. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananus, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Taurus named Saul. At this moment he was praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananus come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananus answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananus went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Psalm 30. This beautifully poetic psalm offers real-life reassurance of the God who is with us in the depths as well as the heights. It holds out the hope of a God who not only meets us in our suffering, but who takes the sackcloth from us and clothes us instead with the joy. This morning's psalm is very much in keeping with the new life theme of Easter and with the notion of God's transforming, generous, and saving kindness. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cry out to you, and you to God. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks and holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cry to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood? If I go down to the pit, 
Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. O Lord, Lord, be my comfort. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sack sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart is to you without ceasing. O oh, Lord, my God, now I will give you thanks forever. The epistle reading is from Revelation, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. The vision of John recorded in Revelation offers a glimpse of cosmic worship around the throne as it is centered as its center is the lamb who was slain. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered my rads and my, of my rads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb to be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell, on, fell down and worshiped. Thanks be to God. This morning's gospel is from John 21. The risen Christ appears again to his disciples by the sea, where they were first called. After echoes of the fishing and the feeding miracles, he gives a final reminder of the cost of a disciple's love and obedience. <laughs> in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go out with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes where he was naked and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they got ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, come and have breakfast. And now none of his disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to him, and did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. And he said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said it to him the third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt, and you used to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which you would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. This is the good news. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's be in the spirit of prayer. Eternal and all merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And I'd like to invite Jenny and CJ up. Anybody else that wants to come for children? Okay. Here we go. The big change. Have you ever seen popcorn before it pops, CJ? You have? I don't think you have. <laughs> yeah, but this is what it looks like before it starts. Did you know that? Feel it. It's hard, isn't it? Would you want to eat that? No, yeah, I wouldn't want to eat that. It's hard to make, break my tooth. You know? And but if you can you hold this, CJ? Yeah, you can talk to me. Okay. <laughs> if we put it in this bag here, right? Throw. You gonna put this in? Put it in. And what's the magic word? Say it. Abracadabra. Pop, pop, pop. You pull out what's in there. It went through a big change, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> wow, it turned into popcorn. That's right. In the reading today from Acts 9, there was this guy, look at money, named Saul. He was very angry and did not like Christians at all. He yelled and screamed at them and he hurt them and beat them up. And sometimes he even killed them. Not a very nice guy, was he? No. <laughs> Then one day, Saul was traveling to this city called Damascus and to get permission to hurt more Christians when, CJ, this bright light came out of the sky and Saul had never seen anything like that. And he heard this voice, Saul, Saul, why do you hurt me? And then Saul fell to his knees, was covering his eyes and shaking and said, who are you? And he says, I'm, I'm Jesus. And with being very afraid, he said, what should I do, Lord? And Jesus replied, go to the city, and someone will meet you there and tell you what to do. And Saul got up, and when he got up, he was blind. Do you know what blind means, CJ? No, you don't. That means close your eyes. Close your eyes like this. Cover them up. Can you see anything? No. Is that, would that be scary if you could never see anything again? Yeah, that would be very scary. So I'm sure Saul was very afraid too. 
And he went with his friends, like the Lord said, to the city. And three days later, he sent a man, a Christian man, and that man, CJ, prayed for him. And you know what he did? The Lord healed him, and he could see again. And you know what was even better, CJ? CJ, get naughty. You know what was even better? You know what was even better? He filled this man with the Holy Spirit. And he came to love Jesus and went around preaching to everyone about Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That man went through a big change. Okay, let's pray. Can you pray for me? Hold your hands. Okay. Dear God, thank you for loving each one of us, even though we don't deserve your love. Help us to love others, even when they're mean. And help us to remember that you can change anyone. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I might come back and sit with CJ so I could eat some popcorn. Come on. Got it? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jenny and CJ. Let me make sure I'm in the proper order since I dropped in. Okay, we're good to go. Will you be in the spirit of prayer with me? Holy and gracious God, we ask that the meditations of our hearts, the words of my mouth, and the movement of the Holy Spirit among us remind us always that you are our Redeemer, our rock, our strength. And for that we give you thanks. Amen. So it was only two weeks ago that we were here singing Jesus Christ is risen today. And the day of resurrection, earth tell it out abroad. But today, even though we're still in the Easter season, we're hearing a story that's a little bit different. I was reminded in a clergy online group about Buddy Holly's song. I wasn't familiar with it. But he wrote this song about rain in his heart. The sun is out, the sky is blue, there's not a cloud to spoil the view, but it's raining, raining in my heart. It could be still raining in all of our hearts, right? We've come to the joy and celebration of Easter and resurrection, but only after we've walked through Lent and Holy Week, following the events of Jesus' last week in Jerusalem and meditating on the stations of the cross. We've remembered the Last Supper, the washing of the disciples' feet, the harrowing events of Good Friday. And if we entered fully into the Passion story, and open to ourselves to be touched by it, the experience may have gone very deep. Profound changes may have taken place in our faith, in our way of thinking and feeling, and in our sense of what God is saying to us. And profound changes are not always comfortable or easy to live with. It may be that whilst we can share in the joy and celebration of the Easter season, we need longer to reflect on our experience of Lent and Holy Week. Something may have touched us so deeply that we need time to reach an understanding of what it has meant to us personally. Last week we heard about Thomas and his very human reaction to feeling hurt and upset and left out. Some of us might have identified with Thomas and found comfort and encouragement in his words last week. This week, some of us may identify with Simon Peter. I offer what I think, at least what I imagine, might have been Simon's very human heart during his conversation with Jesus. And what a conversation it is in a setting filled with sounds of lap, waves lapping at the shore, friends' voices in the background, 
the touch of early morning cool air and the smell of a charcoal fire, fire and grilling fish, and above all, the presence of Simon's beloved and risen Lord. But I think it's raining in Simon's heart. Seeing Jesus again, eating and talking with him, knowing that he's really alive, is somehow not enough. After all, Simon's gone through. He needs a much deeper and more personal healing to bring him to new life and to hope. He's suffering from the terrible pain and shame of self-loathing and a belief that he's totally unlovable. He's suffering from the devastating fear that after what he has done, because of who he is, Jesus will not want him anymore to be Peter, the rock. He's afraid that Jesus will find somebody else upon which he can build his kingdom. But even worse than that, what if Jesus no longer loves Simon or wants him to be his friend? What would be the point of anything anymore, if he's thinking at least in my imagination. On that terrible evening before Good Friday, in the high priest courtyard, with the sound of voices in the background, the bitter touch of dark, dark night's cold, the smell of a charcoal fire burning, Simon Peter was afraid, miserable, and alone. He denied even knowing who Jesus was. Traditionally, it's been suggested that in today's story, Jesus asks three times if Simon loves him, and Simon repeats three times that he does, and so Simon's three denials are canceled out, and he's forgiven and restored as Peter the Rock. But for me, that interpretation is a little simplistic. It doesn't reach the depths of, human, of Simon's very human experience and his distress. It doesn't explain the deep healing and the change which transforms Simon once again into Peter the Rock. So let's look at the story in a bit more depth. Now, there are some New Testament scholars who helped me out with this sermon online, of course, and uh, I can tell you that commentators all agree that in the story, John uses two different words for love. Some say this doesn't really matter. But others feel like it's very, very important. And it sheds light on it, it sheds a different light on what is being said. Now, when I write, not just sermons, but when I write anything, I choose, if I choose two different words to use, which could have the very same meaning, I choose those words for a very good reason, and I think the same applies to the writer of the gospel. He uses two different words to mean love. So I believe he means to use those different words to convey their different meaning. Jesus first asks Simon, not Peter, do you love me more than these? The first word for love that Jesus uses is agapo, a word that has distinctly Christian meaning, a pure, holy love of God. Simon knows from bitter experience that he cannot make any claims about being better or stronger than anybody else, for his loyalty and courage have been brought into question, and he cannot even bring himself to use that agapo word to mean the love that he has for Jesus. Instead, he uses the word filio. It implies much more human caring, friendship. Yes, Lord, you know that I care for you. You know I am your friend. And Jesus asked Simon a second time, do you love me still using agapo, but dropping the comparison to show how the others feel? Once again, Simon can't deny his love, but cannot make any claims about himself. So he sticks to the same reply. Yes, Lord, you know that I care for you, that I am your friend. Now Jesus himself uses the second word for love in a question which cuts Peter to the heart. Simon, do you care for me? 
Are you my friend? Are you sure even of that? Jesus has reached the deep root of Simon's anguish. And his relationship with Je is his relationship with Jesus broken beyond all repair? Simon, already hurting and fragile, seems to break. He was so wrong about himself before. What if he's even wrong about caring for Jesus and about being his friend? Twice now, Jesus has commissioned him to feed his sheep. But what if he can't really do that? Peter was broken by his experiences of that first Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. He lost all confidence in himself as one of the three disciples closest to Jesus. He lost confidence in his self-knowledge. He became unsure of who he really was and what he was capable of. He became afraid of what looked like a very empty future. Self-doubt, self-hate, and despair seemed to take over. And in desperation, Simon throws himself onto the mercy and knowledge of Jesus. Lord, you know everything. You know that I care for you. You know I am your friend. To me, an unspoken question hangs in the air. An unspoken question maybe Simon doesn't ask for the fear of, his, of Jesus' answer. An unspoken question maybe sometimes we don't dare to ask for fear of the answer. Lord, you know everything. You know that I care for you. But Lord, after what I've done, can you still care for me? Can you still love me? Do you still want me to be your disciple? I'm sure Jesus hears and understands that unspoken question. He knows Peter far too well not to hear it. And he knows how to answer that question for Peter. For the third time, he gives him the commission, feed my sheep, follow me. He knows Peter will understand the unspoken part of that answer, too. And we know that Peter responds to it with courage and dedication that Jesus saw in him when he first called him to be Peter the Rock. So today we continue to celebrate Easter together as a church. Our faith is in the risen, ascended, and glorified Christ. But some of us may have unspoken questions growing out of our experience of Lent and Holy Week. Maybe like Peter, we need to have a private conversation with Jesus in which he can hear our spoken and unspoken questions and fears. If that is so, I pray that like Simon Peter, we find the answer, spoken or unspoken, in the way that Jesus responds to each of us. And then our celebration of Easter, our celebration of the resurrection will become heartfelt because it is heart experienced. May it be so. Amen.
invite you to rise in body or spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. Holy One of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you sent your apostles, Philip and James, to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ, God, in your mercy. Hear Revive ecosystems along coastlands that have been devastated by natural forces and human negligence. Re-establish plant and animal life that purifies air and water that feeds humans and other living creatures. God, in your mercy. <laughs> Accompany laborers who get little rest from their work. Give them hope when they struggle to produce what they need. Give all who labor fair treatment and just wages. God, in your mercy. <laughs> Restore all people who cry to you for help, especially Wilbur, Dick, Megan, Emma, Terry, Nancy, Dawn, Kim, Ed and Beverly, Devon, Linda, Scott, Debbie, Shirley, Michelle, Amy, Pauline, Ralph, Jennifer, Alan, Joan, Dale, Hazley, Ed, Betty, Jean and Joan, Tim, Briley, Howard and Nancy, Nevin, Cassie, Darlene, Cindy, Barbara, Lorraine, Anna Mae, Julie, Brooke, Mabel, Ardella, Martha, Gary, members of our recovery groups, the family of Kathleen Ott, and the family of Diana Bucko. Turn their mourning into dancing, clothe them with joy, and put a testimony of healing and praise on their lips. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be present to faithful ones who are persecuted for following you, especially in churches around the world. Sustain them by your faithfulness and give them strength in the name of Jesus. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Join, join our voices with angels, creatures, and all the saints in praising Christ and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Reveal Christ's glory to us and through us in our worship. God, in your mercy, in your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. My friends, the Holy One has given us fish and bread for a lifetime. Let us now share from our bounty and through our gifts, God's will may be done. <clears throat>
let us pray. God, you have the power to transform the most unlikely people into influential witnesses. We dedicate ourselves to being open to the movement of the Holy Spirit and moments where we might be agents of healing and change in today's world. Use our gifts to show people your presence in their everyday lives. Help us to be a means for encountering the risen Christ in a broken world. Amen. Amen. The risen Christ dwells with us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good to glorify you at all times and in all places, O God. Through your living word, you created all things and pronounced them good. You made human beings in your own image, persons capable of entering into relationships both with you and with each other. You have called us as sisters and brothers to be a great family. So today we join with all your people on earth, praising your name in unending song, singing together. Merciful God, as sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And likewise, Jesus took a cup, and after giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. O holy God, creator of all people and worlds, send now upon this bread and cup your life-giving spirit, May this outpouring of the promised spirit transfigure this Thanksgiving meal, that this bread and this cup may become for us the body and blood of Christ. As we partake of this holy meal, fill us with the Holy Spirit, that we may be one body, one spirit in Christ. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ brings.
Christ has set the you may be seated. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come, as we prepare ourselves to receive this holy sacrament, we remember that we are part of the living body of Christ in the whole world. We come to this table with different needs and we come in different ways. The bread represents our brokenness. So I ask you to partake when you are ready. When you eat of this bread, remember that it is the body of Christ broken for you and for me. Let the people say amen. Amen. And as we partake of this, the cup of blessing, we acknowledge our unity in Christ Jesus. So please hold your cup and let us partake as one. My friends, drink this, for it is the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. Let the people say amen. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. Go in peace, tell what God has done. Thanks be to God.